This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 32, Dimension, Rank, and Nullity. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand why the dimension of a subspace is well-defined, understand and apply the rank nullity theorem, and compute the rank and nullity of a given matrix. In lecture 30, we talked about the notion of basis, where when we have a subspace of Rn, a basis for H is a linearly independent set of vectors that spans H. We define the dimension of H to be the number of vectors in any basis for H. We have a special exception to this though. The set containing just the zero vector is a subspace of Rn, but this subspace doesn't have a basis. We define the dimension of this subspace to be zero. Now the same subspace can have many different bases, and our definition of dimension assumes that any two different bases for the same subspace would have to have the same number of vectors. But we don't know that that's true from first principles, we're going to have to prove it. And until we do, the term dimension isn't well defined. It's important that when we have definitions in mathematics, that the definitions themselves don't assume any facts that we haven't proved to be true. So to prove that dimension is well defined, we're first going to have to prove a theorem. The theorem states that if you have a subspace H and a basis for that subspace that has P vectors, then any set of more than p vectors from H must be linearly dependent. And you should compare this theorem to the more vectors than entries theorem that we learned back in lecture 16. So here's the theorem. Let H be a subspace of Rn, and let script B be the set containing the vectors B1 through Bp, and let's let that be a basis for H. And we claim that any set of Q vectors in H with Q greater than P is linearly dependent. So let's let V1 through Vq be vectors from H. We want to show that these vectors are linearly dependent, and we're going to use the coordinates of these vectors in the basis B. And we learned about coordinate vectors in the previous lecture. And let's consider the vector equation x1 times the coordinate vector of v1 in the basis B, plus x2 times the coordinate vector of v2 relative to the basis B, and so on, all the way up through xq times the coordinate vector of vq relative to the basis B, and let's set that equal to the zero vector and solve. Notice that the coordinate vectors have p entries because the basis has p vectors in it. And so if we think about what the coefficient matrix of this homogeneous vector equation looks like, it has p rows because the vectors in the equation have p entries, and it has q columns because the equation has q variables. But because q is greater than p, that means that this coefficient matrix has more columns than rows, and in particular, it can't have a pivot in every column. That means that at least one of these variables must be free, which means that this vector equation has a non-trivial solution. That non-trivial solution gives us a dependence relation among the coordinate vectors of the v's. And that looks like this. c1 times the coordinate vector of v1, plus c2 times the coordinate vector of v2, plus plus plus, and so on, up through cq times the coordinate vector of vq, that must equal the zero vector. And those scalars are not all zero. Now we talked in the previous lecture about the correspondence between vectors and their coordinate vectors. And we said that that correspondence is a one-to-one -one and onto linear transformation, which means that we can rewrite the left-hand side of this equation as the coordinate vector of c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus 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 cq vq equals the zero vector. But that's telling us that the coordinates of that vector are all zeros. Now, so what does that tell us about the highlighted vector on the left-hand side? Well, if its coordinates are all zeros, that means that the vector itself is equal to zero times each of the basis vectors all added together. And that means that that vector is the zero vector. So the vector c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus 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 cq vq has to be the zero vector. But again, since the c scalars are not all zero, this is a dependence relation for the v vectors, which means the v's are linearly dependent, which is what we wanted. So why does this theorem help us prove that dimension is well defined? Well, let's imagine that we have the situation that we were afraid of, where we have two bases with a different number of vectors in each basis. Let's let script B be the set containing B1 through BP, and script C be the set containing C1 through CQ, where Q is greater than P. What happens now? Well, from the previous theorem, script C, because it has more vectors than the basis B, the set script C must be linearly dependent. But it can't be linearly dependent because it's a basis. That contradiction tells us that this can't happen, and therefore every basis for a given subspace must have the same number of vectors, and we call that number the dimension. Now one of the ways that dimension is useful is that it gives us an easier way to construct a basis for a given subspace. 
If h is a subspace with dimension p, then it turns out, as we'll see in the next theorem, that any linearly independent set of p vectors in h must be a basis for h. So if we know the dimension for a subspace, all we need to do is find a linearly independent set with the correct number of vectors in it, and that will automatically be a basis. So here's the theorem. It says let h be a subspace of Rn with dimension p. If script b, which is the set containing v1 through vp, is a linearly independent subset of h with p elements, then script b is a basis for h. So to prove that script b is a basis for h, remember that basis means two things. It means that the set spans the subspace and that the set is linearly independent. But we already know that the set is linearly independent, so all we need to do is show that script b spans h. So to do that, let's let w be any vector in h. And our goal here is to show that w can be written as a linear combination of v1 through vp. Let's consider this set, where what we've done is added w to the set script b. So this set has p plus 1 vectors in it, which is more vectors than the dimension of h, which means that by the theorem that we proved earlier, that set must be linearly dependent. Now in lecture 16, we proved something called the characterization of linearly dependent sets. And this theorem tells us that when we have a linearly dependent set, one of the vectors in the set must be a linear combination of the vectors that came before it, of the preceding vectors. But in this set, that vector can't be any of the v's because the set script b, the set containing just the v's, that set is linearly independent. So it must be w. The only vector in this new set that we've created that could be a linear combination of the preceding vectors is w, and that proves that w is a linear combination of the v's, which means that script b spans h, and therefore b is a basis for h. So when we specifically apply the idea of dimension to the column space or null space of a matrix, we use the words rank and nullity. So the rank of a matrix is the dimension of its column space, and the nullity of a matrix is the dimension of its null space. And we have a theorem called the rank nullity theorem that states that the rank of A plus the nullity of A equals N, where N is the number of columns of A. Before we get into why the rank nullity theorem is true, let's work through an example. So here we have a matrix A, and first we're asked to compute the rank of A. So the rank of A is the dimension of the column space of A, which is the number of vectors in a basis for the column space of A. So let's find a basis for the column space of A and then just count the number of vectors in that basis, that number will be the rank of A. So let's remember the process we learned back in lecture 30. So we row reduce A, we identify its pivots, and the corresponding pivot columns of the original matrix A form a basis for the column space of A. There are four pivot columns, which means that the rank of A is four. Now let's compute the nullity of A. The nullity of A is the dimension of the null space of A, and so what we're going to do is find a basis for the null space of A and count the number of vectors in that basis. Again, remembering the process from lecture 30, to find a basis for the null space of A, we solve the equation Ax equals 0 and write the solution in parametric vector form. We've already row reduced A, so we can write the general solution, which you see here, x1 equals x5, x2 equals negative x6 minus x7, x3 equals negative x6, x4 equals x5, and x5, x6, and x7 are all free. This lets us write our solution in parametric vector form with three vectors, one for each free variable. And so those three vectors form our basis for the null space of A. Since there are three vectors, the nullity of A is three. And the rank nullity theorem in this case tells us that the rank of A plus the nullity of A equals the number of columns of A. Well, this matrix has seven columns. And so the rank of A, which is four, plus the nullity of A, which is three, equals seven. So that checks out. Now we can Compute the rank and nullity in an easier way, because the rank of A is the number of vectors in a basis for the column space of A, which is the number of pivot columns of A. And the nullity of A is the number of free variables in the equation Ax equals 0, which is the number of non-pivot columns of A. And so clearly, if we add up the number of pivot columns of A plus the number of non-pivot columns of A, we're going to get the number of columns of A. And all we need to do is row reduce our matrix and count the pivots and the non-pivot columns, and those two numbers respectively will be the rank and nullity of A. This also gives us a few more different ways to characterize when a square matrix is invertible. Let's go through these one at a time. The first one here says the columns of A form a basis for Rn. But we know that a basis is a set of vectors that span Rn and are linearly independent, but those two statements were already part of our invertible matrix theorem. The second one here says that the column space of A is Rn. That's just another way of saying that the columns of A span Rn, which was part of our invertible matrix theorem back in lecture 25. 
The third one here says that the rank of A is n, and what we've said before is that that rank equals the number of pivots in our matrix, and the matrix having n pivots was another part of our invertible matrix theorem. Next, we say that the null space of A is just the set containing the zero vector, but the null space is the set of all solutions of the equation Ax equals zero, and so this says that the only solution of Ax equals zero is x equals zero, and that was already another statement of our invertible matrix theorem. And then finally, the nullity of A equaling zero means that A has no non-pivot columns, which is just a twisted way of saying that A has a pivot in every column, which is again part of our invertible matrix theorem. So this lecture ties up the discussion that we started all the way back in lecture 25, where we talked about different ways of characterizing invertible matrices, and we're going to transition in the next lecture to start talking about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. See you then! Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.